Uh, welcome to the Journey Lecture Series of 2020-2021 at Nikia. Rod was supposed to give this lecture in April and then we waited and waited so that we can have food and gathering back in our lives, but that did not happen. Uh, but the show must go on. And so Rod has kindly agreed to give the first journey lecture of 2020 uh, and uh, 2021 academic year. And this journey lecture is a series that uh, we have been having for the past two years, listening to our colleagues and uh, listening about their uh, ways, how they arrived at this point, uh, how, looking at this moment and reflecting on the journey. And our tradition has been that someone who is closely working with the journey lecturer, a student or a colleague or a mentee or a friend gets the honor to introduce uh, the speaker. So with that, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Trivello Raghunathan, Rod's longtime friend and collaborator, to introduce Professor Rod Little. Uh, thank you, Brahma. Um, so Brahma emailed me saying that she's going to be, she's having a dental appointment and she's going to be numb. And Brahma are numb? So I, that didn't jive. So, but I, my head started spinning. So then I started talk, thinking about where did I meet Rod first? I think it was in 1984. I was just uh, shy of two years in the US and it was at Harvard and there, there was, um, at that time, US Census Bureau had this arrangement called um, Joint Statistical Agreements under which I think we'll do a lot of research for the census and Don Bin was on that, uh, had a joint statistical agreement. And that's where I think first I came in contact with um, Rod. And you know, Rod is British, you know, and Indians and British have a, kind of a complex relationship and, um, and as a child, I grew up with lots of uncles and aunts who had uh, involved in the freedom struggles and so on and so forth. And they all had created uh, an image of uh, Britishers that is always from this perspective. <laughs> so I said, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do with Rod. The end. And then, um, so when I first met, he had a, he had really strong British accent and I had, a, I have a, Indian accent, somehow we got by and, um, but over time at every meeting, uh, the, our, 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 our bonds got stronger and stronger and he became my great mentor and became a great friend, great boss and, 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 and is fantastic human being. So, I, th I thought that it was a, uh, it is a honor for me to uh, introduce him. And you have heard about him a lot and he has won lots and lots of awards. And um, yeah, you know, uh, like uh, he is a member of National Academy of Sciences. He is a distinguished university professor. He has won the Cox Fisher Lecture, the Wilkes Award, blah, 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 so on and so forth. One of what I'm just eagerly looking for is to call him as Sir Roderick. That's what I'm 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 rooting for. But all these awards are um, secondary to uh, one big award he has is a very nice person and nice mentor, nice person to be with. And with that, I would invite Rod to give his uh, lecture on his journey. Okay, I'd love to, but my uh, share screen is disabled at the moment, so I don't quite know how to do that. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Can, uh, host, can the host uh, enable that? Kerry, can you please enable that? Yep, I'll look into it right now. Can you make me a co-host? I should do it. I, yeah. So, while we get before, while we get this sorted out, um, 
if you hear anything, it's Chewy. If he's he's sitting on the uh, sofa here, so if you hear barking, that's Chewy. Uh, thanks, uh, Brahma and Ragu. It's great fun, an honor to be here. Uh, Ragu was actually my boss at ISR when he was the Survey Research Center director. So I guess we we swapped a bit. So. Uh, let's see if I can. No, still disabled. So. I'm not seeing a way to specifically allow that. Um, if you hover yeah. over my name. Oh, I see. The other, and you should say allow co-host. Got it. Look at the dot, dot, yep. dots. Yep, there you go. Okay. All right, so we're getting there. I'm going to open my PowerPoint, and hopefully everybody can see that. So, yes. Good. So thank you again, everybody. And uh, I just have to get this started. So slideshow from the beginning. Okay. So let me get rid of all you people because I can't see my slides when I see you. So. All right. So, uh, so it's great fun to be here. And thank you very much. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking about um, my career and having a bit of fun, maybe. Um, so uh, here are the places that I've lived, and uh, we're going to take a little journey to these places, um, starting off on the top left with, uh, in, in London, and then eventually ending up in, in Ann Arbor at the bottom with the, the Michigan flag, so, with a few places in between, as you'll see. So um, I was born in a, in a little village called Chelsfield, which is just outside of London, and uh, you can see... Um, that uh, it, uh, nowadays it's close to the M25, for those of you who know the, the ring road that goes around London. Um, in the, when I was born, it was right in the country. So London has since encroached on Chelsea. It was a tiny little place. After about a year, um, my family moved to a, a place a little bit closer to London called Bromley. And we lived in Bromley for uh, about five years until eventually we moved to Scotland. Um, the, uh, uh, my father uh, was the night editor of the Daily Mirror, which is a, a prominent uh, tabloid newspaper in England. Um, so he, he worked in Fleet Street. Um, so this is a picture um, of uh, uh, the kids. So uh, I'm the rather self-satisfied looking character on the left. I was called Roddy in those days. My, my twin brother, uh, Chris or Christy, was, is on the right side. He's looking kind of peeved with his elder brother because I was 15 years older than he was. We were identical twins, by the way. And uh, that's my sister, Janet, at the top there, looking like she's, uh, look, she's dreaming up some evil things to, to, uh, per to perpetrate on her little brothers. Um, so we moved um, from Brom Bromley and London up to uh, uh, Glasgow when I was about five years old where my father became the editor of the Scottish Daily Record, which is the largest circulation paper in Scotland. Um, this is actually the house I lived in uh, initially, it was rented house actually, it was owned by the, uh, uh, by the um, paper. You can see it's a rather magnificent house that uh, uh, we lived in for a number of years until um, eventually we moved out. Um, so these are my parents. These are uh, uh, very prized possessions of mine. These are actually sketches that were done by uh, um, a cartoonist at the Mirror called Ralph Salon, who wrote, they did very nice cartoons. And she, he did a cartoon of my mother, obviously on the left, and my, my father on the right, and they sit on my wall in our den. Um, so what about my parents? So my mother, um, Margaret, uh, was, was Nay Shimon, which is actually interesting, uh, a name that actually comes from the Isle of Man. So she lived to the ripe old age of 96. And uh, we like to say that the secrets of her long longevity were she liked whiskey, butter, and cream. Uh, so anyway, she, uh, she had a long um, and productive life. She was born in uh, Middlesbrough in Yorkshire, um, northern part of England, uh, left school early to care for her mother who had uh, rheumatoid arthri arthritis. So she didn't, wasn't able to complete her education, um, although she was a very smart woman. She was very no-nonsense and systems-oriented. 
um, and she was very logical. So I feel like I got my math skills and uh, also a bit of a passion for doing crosswords and Sudokus, Sudokus and the like from her. Um, the, uh, the subheader there, if too much leave some, was a, is a kind of private joke with our family because she, she once had a dinner and she, she left the dinner in the oven because she was going out for something and um, uh, left a note saying, if too much leave some. So I think that just shows her logical uh, turn of phrase. So as I said, uh, my brother and I were uh, identical twins. She had, we had them when my mother was age 40. Um, Chris was not expected, so, uh, so it was a little bit of a shock for my mother. Um, anyway, she was, uh, you know, she, as in normal in those days, she was a homemaker. Um, she, had, she was an editor's wife, so she fulfilled all the functions of an editor's wife. She was also a piano teacher, um, well, she didn't teach his, her kids, actually. She taught um, other kids, um, and she was a very sensitive pianist, and... Uh, there was a lot of music in the house. Uh, my brother and I um, used to play duets together. I played the clarinet and my brother played the flute. And my mother would uh, accompany us on the piano. So that was a nice time. My father, Alex Little, um, was, uh, um, you see various pictures of her, him uh, at the top here. Um, he was one of uh, seven kids in, in North Shields, which is a I describe it as a gritty Tyneside shipbuilding town near Newcastle, northeast of England. He didn't go to college um, and uh, entered journalism and uh, started off as an office boy in the local newspaper and then eventually became, as I said, became the editor of the largest circulation tabloid paper in Scotland. Um, he'd probably cringe at what the, the Daily Mirror and the Daily Record looks like these days with tabloids, but. Uh, um, because they've, uh, I don't know, we, we could go into a long diatribe about uh, British uh, press, but I won't do that here. He was an intellectual in many ways and a Renaissance man. I think he had a lot of, he had a lot of opinions. He was opinionated and he had many interests, politics, music, theater, poetry, literature, painting. He was not a very good painter, unlike uh, Janet, who actually turned out to be a, a very talented painter. And he does do gardening, which I don't. So that skips a generation, I'm told. Um, so I inherited from my father um, a belief in the importance of freedom of the press, which is perhaps not surprising. Also an interest in good writing, um, because my father had a real uh, gift, I think, for words. And uh, I have an example on the next slide. So this is written sometime early in the morning, 1954, just after we moved. To Glasgow, he had some kind of trouble in the office and uh, wrote this about uh, his daughter. If I had a master's touch great enough to be simple, poignantly so, so I could set down my darling girl, words you could read when you are older, and know, perhaps with tears, how your freshness and innocence, your blue and red and gold, your gravity and your laugh, your lovely piercing quick sympathy, your blinding tears and an impatient word and the purity of your sleeping face have brimmed my heart with happiness and even gratitude of the sweet grace wrought when adult existence needs the healing of such clear springs and the blessed touch of never, forget, of never forgettable young trusting arms and lips. My father um, loved plays and he, he, he liked to... Uh, uh, so he liked theater, basically. So uh, one of his prized possessions was a clunky Magnavox tape, box, tape recorder. It looks something like this picture that I have here. Um, and he used to record family playlets, um, things like the wall scene from Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream in Yorkshire accents. He also made up plays as well. So this might be of some relevance to those of you who know my skit interests later. So... Um, after a couple of years in, in, in Scotland, um, Chris and I, my brother and I, attended Glasgow Academy. Um, this is a picture of us uh, early on in Glasgow Academy with our school uniforms. You can see the uh, arrows to, to, to me and my brother. Chris and I, uh, so Glasgow Academy is kind of prestigious Scottish public school, public meaning private, for those of you who don't know the lingo in, in, in Britain. Um, 
Chris and I were what's known as Sassanacs, which is kind of a, a, a derogatory term for English people in Scotland. But uh, so we were a little bit uh, perhaps loners. Um, the teaching in the school was a, a variable quality, although um, some of it was actually very good. There was a lot of interest in sports, um, rugby in particular, um, and that seemed to perhaps get more play than academics, although there were some, uh, some good academics as well. Um, towards the end of my time in, at Glasgow Academy, um, I had some really nice time hiking. Um, the school had a cadet corps, and uh, so they had these army trucks and uh, one of the masters used to uh, take a bunch of kids up in the, in the truck, which you can see on the top left of this thing. And we'd go on hikes in, in Scotland. Of course, one of the beautiful things about Scotland is, uh, are the mountains. And so we had some very nice uh, times uh, hiking um, towards the end of my time at Glasgow Academy. Now, hiking has always been something I've been very interested in. So um, maths or math, as, you, as the US would call it, was our best subject. We were both very close together academically. And uh, we had a, a math teacher, um, Chick Thornton, his name was, kind of an eccentric guy and, and volatile. Um, but he inspired people and he inspired my brother and I to apply to study maths at, at Cambridge University. By the way, Nick Jewell, who some of you may know, um, prominent biostatistician who became the provost at UC, U, U California, Berkeley, was also Thornton's student in the class below me. And he inspired a number of other people. Actually, I think um, math teachers can be extremely uh, influential in terms of careers. So I want to put in a good word for that. Uh, by the way, I filled in right at the end of my time at Glasgow Academy, I actually did some teaching. Um, um, just before I went to college, which uh, I still have nightmares about doing that. You can imagine being a student and then becoming a teacher is fairly traumatic, particularly since I didn't know what I was doing. I'm sure about that. Anyway, um, so uh, thanks to this math teacher, we ended up uh, applying, getting into uh, Cambridge University. And uh, Chris and I both went to the same college as twins, um, Gonville and Keyes College. Uh, um, you can see the picture on the right is called the Gate of Honor. It's the most famous building in Gonville and Keys. It sits next to Trinity College, which has the famous chapel. And so I spent a very happy three years at uh, Cambridge studying mathematics. So some thoughts about my time at Cambridge. I made some very good friends. Um, alas, all male, because nearly all the colleges were male in those days, and particularly if you were kind of feckless in terms of girls, it was basically we had uh, male friends, not many not female friends. One, of, one time we traveled to Spain, North Africa, Italy and back in a very slow van, had some very good times doing that. Uh, what else? Well, at Cambridge you're not supposed to look, look as if you're studying, you're supposed to, so pretending not to study was one of my activities, although I guess I did a bit of studying as well. I played squash and then, and then we did some rowing. So I have a picture here of uh, the Keys fourth boat, which was the first boat that I rowed in. Um, this is actually, uh, it's, our boat is about to get bumped. This is actually the bumps and it's a way of racing in Cambridge because the river cam is too narrow to let boats pass each other. So the way you race is that you chase after the boat ahead of you and you actually get literally bumped if you lose. And so then those boats pass to the side and, uh, and then the boat behind them then chases the next one ahead of you. So it's kind of a, an amusing way of uh, racing. Uh, we were not very good, but we got a bit better actually. We ended up, uh, my friends ended up in the second boat and we did, uh, we got a little bit better at rowing as we went on. As probably most of people, guys do anyway in college, I drank too much beer. I also played clarinet in, in the college orchestra. Um, here's another picture from Cambridge. This is uh, one of the nice activities you can do in Cambridge is punting on the river in the backs of the colleges. And this is a picture early on in my days in Cambridge um, of uh, punting on the cam. You might, there, there's something a little bit wrong with this picture if you look at it for a second. Uh, that is uh, the polar, the person who's punting is supposed to be actually in the punt. You can see that our polar 
friend of mine is actually sit on the bank. So it's not quite working out the way it's supposed to work out. Um, as, as a lot of my pictures, a picture, this is a picture of Chris, not a picture of me. Um, not that it necessarily makes much difference to you. Um, if you're punting on the can, you can stop, stop off at Grantchester and, and get a cream tea. So um, very yummy. And that was what I was going to have for my food after my seminar. Unfortunately, it has to be virtual. Although uh, Robin and I actually made some scones um, this morning. So the, the picture is the, of the scones we made in the morning. And the cream tea consists of uh, clotted cream, which is the thing on the right, and, and jam. And of course, English tea. I should have said milk because I did it. We take it with milk. And you put the milk in first for those of you who know about Fisher's um, experiments about, about whether you put the milk in first. So, so actually, I'm going to have uh, uh, some of this afterwards. I'm sorry I can't share it with a few folks in the audience. Donovan Keyes was a college of uh, the famous statistician R. A. Fisher and also a geneticist, and also uh, many of you know Stephen Hawking, the famous uh, um, um, astrophysicist who's uh, pictured here. Uh, he he was sort of one. I didn't know him, but he was wandering around in his uh, in his uh, um, uh, wheelchair when he was at when I was there. Um, I took a lot of pure math, uh, no statistics, by the way, just pure math, um, and uh, eventually graduated with an upper second degree, so which is kind of middle, middling kind of a degree, not terribly good, but not, not uh, too bad either. My brother, by the way, got a first, so I, I say girl, I, I should say congratulations, of course, but... Uh, all of you know about sibling rivalry, but there's also twin rivalry, which might be at a different level from sibling rivalry. Anyway, here's a picture of us uh, graduating from Gonville and Keys in 1971. And uh, I sometimes use this as a quiz. Um, so you, you can take a look at this picture and see which of them you think is me and which of them you think is Chris. Um, if you think it's the guy with the beard, then you've been fooled because Chris had a beard then, but I didn't have a beard. So this is actually me on the right. Mind this, I'm tiny but taller than Chris. That might be the, the picture, that might be the uh, clue. Well, in summers, uh, I was involved in something called Holiday Fellowship. So Holiday Fellowship has guest houses that offer guided day hikes, um, beautiful, um, country houses actually uh, that are turned into guest houses. And in the evenings, they had country dancing, they had table tennis competitions, they had treasure hunts, concerts with songs and skits, and uh, a lot of good fun. So uh, during college, uh, Chris and I had summer jobs as what's known as the secretary. And the secretary basically led the walks in the hills and also did some handling of money. And uh, this was uh, a lot of fun. And uh, see, there's a couple of pictures here from, from those days uh, um, in Wales and uh, in, in Glencoe in Scotland. Robin, I can't hear. Could you? Excuse me a second. Robin, could you not talk? She can't hear me. So. All right. So these holiday fellowship jobs uh, were, a, were a good antidote for shyness, which I was pretty shy, and also twin-centeredness. You tend to, your life tends to revolve around your twin brother. Also, the staff at these uh, places were foreign girls, so actually my first girlfriends were actually from Germany and Finland, which is kind of interesting. So what happened after Cambridge? Well, I tried to find a job, and... Uh, Fortunately, didn't find one, so I had a failed job search. Um, so I was looking for a master's program in, uh, in operations research, actually. And I had a girlfriend who, who was in London at the time, so um, stumbled on this uh, master's course in, in statistics and operations research at Imperial College London. So I decided to go down there and do a master's degree. So uh, this is just a one-year master's in statistics and operations research. Um, well, I wanted to do operations research, but it turned out to be 95% statistics and 5% operations research. So 
I ended up doing statistics, which turned out to be, to my mind now, a, a really very good move. The uh, professor at Imperial College, a very famous statistician called Sir David Cox, or David Cox in those days, but now Sir David Cox, um, and he was a great uh, person to learn some early statistics from. Um, the uh, operations research side of the master's degree was basically Martin Beale, who was a visiting professor. And uh, as part of my master's project, um, I did a, a, a project on missing data with, with Martin Beale. Uh, you can see he had, actually has a famous book on optimization. He's, he's quite, a, a, quite a prominent uh, OR guy. Well, I didn't get a job after my master's degree either. Clearly, I was kind of useless. Um, but uh, Professor Cox uh, kindly admitted me into the PhD program where he gave, he gave me a topic and I had basically no clue. For those of you who are PhD students in the department, department, imagine you've had exactly one year of statistics. I had no statistics in undergraduate. And then you have to try and do, a, do, do research. I mean, it seems a little strange, odd to me. Anyway, I didn't have any idea what I was doing. So eventually, Professor Cox told me, well, why don't you go back and work on your MS project on missing data uh, as a PhD topic. So I then uh, went back and worked with uh, Martin Beale. And here is my first public published paper, which is uh, obviously a great thing, um, in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society. On um, uh, this is the uh, a topic that I on missing data that I did my thesis. Um, missing data then proved to be a great topic for future research, and uh, I've written a, since then and I've done, done a lot more, written a lot more papers on this topic. Then uh, um, the last year at Imperial, um, we were talking about doing concerts and parties and, 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 and the like. So I decided to organize a, a concert um, with a bit of fun. And this is actually the, uh, uh, the list of names on the, uh, who par participated in this concert. John Nelder, some of you may know, is a pretty prominent English statistician, also a, a terrific pianist. Um, other people here, you probably don't know. Paul Tukey was actually, uh, I think, the nephew of John Tukey, who's a famous statistician. Um, and I think Schubert Leader might have been Paul, uh, his, his wife at that time. The second half, oh, so I played some a Brahms piano, a movement from a Brahms clarinet trio. Uh, the second half, we had uh, more silly stuff. So piano rags, and then uh, Saint-Saëns the Swan. I, I suspect that a lot of the swans were actually males dressed up as females. Um, uh, water music variations, I have no idea what that was about. And then uh, the gospel according to RAF, which is not the Royal Air Force, it's R.A. Fisher, of course, and various other sketches. So, um, you know, some of you know that I like to write songs. So this might be the first one I actually wrote. It was called the Hippostatimus Song. It was based on a song by Flanders and Swan, who are very prominent uh, um, people for making up funny uh, songs in those days. He had, they had a hippopotamus song that went something like this, mud, mud, glorious mud, nothing quite like it for cooling the blood. So follow me, follow down to the hollow and there let us wallow in glorious mud. So, um, I made a sort of cover on this. I had some clever statistical words like Bayes, Bayes, empirical Bayes. I've looked for a prior for 76 days. The resulting posterior is shockingly inferior. So no, I'm returning to classical ways. Of course, I ended up being Bayesian. So I've changed my mind again. And then a, a verse about Glim, which is the first package for doing generalized linear models. Also around that time, um, John Elliot Gardner, who some of you may, may know, a very prominent English conductor, now Sir John Elliot Gardner, was doing um, original instrument approaches to uh, 17th and 18th century classical music, Bach mm -hmm. and Handel and the like. And um, Imperial College Choir uh, put on uh, the setting that uh, 
the, the gardener had actually said of Monteverdi's uh, Vespers of 1610, a fantastic piece. So I thought this is look like a lot of fun, so I, I had to try and sing in this. So I, I, I got in and we sang the Monteverdi Vespers. Uh, the choir was actually conducted by an engineering professor, interesting enough. This is a picture of me much later actually singing in a, in a U, UMS choral union rehearsal. So this started a lifelong love of choral music and uh, just a few pictures of singing over the years. Um, this is actually in Carnegie Hall. Um, the conductor of this rehearsal is actually the Jerry Blackstone, who was a wonderful uh, conductor of the UMS Choral Union. Um, and then uh, this is a little ad hoc choral union group singing in the Ann Arbor Summer Festival. I think it must have been rehearsal. You probably would have dressed better at the main thing. This is the temple choir of the Kol Halev, which is the temple that we belong to in Ann Arbor. And um, finally, the Arbor Consort, which is this uh, uh, madrigal group um, that's been tremendous, I, wonderful fun to me. Uh, Elizabeth on the right is the president who's actually uh, in, in the department. Um, this is us singing at the Renaissance Festival in Holly. Um, we didn't get to sing. Um, outside this year or they had some kind of parade going that we did some singing and um, I, I love singing madrigals. Also uh, um, at the, in the summer um, before I went to the States uh, I, I joined the Mountaineering Club at Imperial College um, who were going to uh, France to do some uh, climbing and uh, this is a trip up Mont Blanc that we took in August of 1974. Um, Hope you like my look with the uh, uh, the shorts and the gaiters on the left, and uh, the bottom right picture is us on the top of Mont Blanc, the highest mountain in Europe. You can see the weather was not so nice at the top, but uh, we had uh, some good times doing that. So then, uh, seventy um, four, um, I, uh, uh, I I um, thanks to uh, uh, Sir David. David Cox, he put me uh, on, onto a job uh, at the University of Chicago um, in the statistics department. They had this idea that the English statisticians somehow knew how to analyze data. So they'd, get them get, they'd call up uh, Sir David or David in those days and ask if they have any students and he, he suggested me. So, so I ended up going to Chicago. So my first trip to the States. This is the statistics department faculty uh, in 1975. Um, for those of you who are not statisticians, probably wouldn't mean very much, but this is actually a pretty distinguished uh, group of uh, statisticians, Raj Bahadur. Um, Pat Billingsley wrote a book about uh, um, probability. Leo Goodman, um, who was a log linear model guy. Bill Krusko was a very famous social science uh, um, statistician. Paul Meyer, who was a very famous biostatistician, who was the chair at the time. Mike Perlman and, and, and uh, particularly mentioned David Wallace, who uh, there was a memorial session for David Wallace um, this year at the Joint Statistical Meetings. He was a, a great mentor and knowledgeable. You might notice there's something wrong with this picture, and that is uh, they're all men. So one of the things that's happened, which has been obviously very positive, is that we at least we have a lot more women in statistics these days than, uh, than we did in those days. I was amused by this uh, caption contest from the New Yorker. I've occasionally tried to do a caption for this, but never won it. Anyway, I like this caption of these guys coming out of the room and uh, the person saying, uh, hold on, the Senate Committee on Women's Health, it's getting out. So very clever caption. So one of the nice things is we have a lot more women. And of course, we have a, a glorious uh, woman chair in Brummer at the moment. So a shout out to her. Thank you very much for, for sending the flowers and the, and the goodies. Roman. Thank you, Raj. I needed to bribe you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, one of the things that we did at Chicago, and this was my first job really as a, as, as, a, as, a, as a faculty member, was that there was an exam, first year master's exam, um, and uh, the faculty made up questions in their own area for this master's exam. And uh, I think for some reason they asked me to coordinate this thing. Maybe it was uh, the sort of job they gave young faculty. Um, so uh, uh, the uh, so 
there was this exam, and, and there's a bit of a spoiler here because you notice that the date was April the 1st, which uh, might be a slightly different day. So I sort of made up an exam, and here are some of the questions. Um, and I try to match, well, the questions are idiotic for those who don't know statistics, but they also match up with the, uh, the faculty members. So the admissibility of pi estimation by dropping Buffon's needle on a five-dimensional cone by Mike Perlman, who's kind of a mathy guy. Estimation of the seventh cumulant of the Pearson type four curve with A is blah, blah, by David Wallace, who loved the, his Pearson curves. Formulate questions four and seven as a log linear model because L.A. Goodman, uh, Leo Goodman, Shelby Haberman is other log linear model guy. Generate a random walk by the quadrangular twisted Martini Gale method. Investigate convergence to the horizontal by exploiting magical properties of the likelihood ratio. This is actually a, a play because we had a, we used to go to the faculty club and, and, and have drinks. And uh, Raj Bahadur had a, had a martini with a twist. And uh, so this is a bit of a play on that. And then uh, the last one that I've got here is uh, uh, Sandy Zabel, who's, uh, who was very interested in history. And uh, so he was stating Laplace's law of succession in French and then listing the English monarchs and so on. So it was a bit of fun. There was also um, singing, although this is not my song, it's actually Mike Perlman, who's now in Seattle. Um, and he wrote a, a very, I thought, a very amusing song, song based on Monty Python's Lumberjack, Lumberjack song. Some of you will probably be familiar with the Lumberjack song. It's uh, very non-PC, by the way, so it wouldn't be, definitely wouldn't be allowed these days. But anyway, Mike Perlman had these very amusing uh, words. It goes something like this. I won't do the chorus. That's just repeating the words. I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm a statistician. I'm okay. I sleep all night and I work all day. I take square roots and natural logs. See histograms rise and fall. I then transform the data till it makes no sense at all. I pick my priors improperly, a Bayesian pure and true. My priors non-informative, my inference is too. When day is done, my cue is bent, I gently lay me down. Then drink 13 martinis and go out on the town. Very good. There are other verses, but I can't show them all. This is actually a picture of... Uh, of Michael Perman on uh, with my uh, with Robin, my wife to be, so at a party. But I think it rained a lot at that party. I think see Robin's wearing a raincoat. So, so we had I had some very good memories of Chicago. Uh, I mentioned David Wallace, who was a very influential statistician and a wonderful uh, guy. Um, I also taught some basic statistics rather badly. Probably learned some lessons trying to do too much, you know. Paul Meyer, um, who is this famous statistician, his uh, paper on survival analysis has 58,000 citations the last time I checked. Uh, anyway, he had a boat. So Robin and Zandi Isabel and I went out on his boat and then we got towed back in a storm. So one of these quick storms went over Lake Michigan and we had to, we had to get back in a hurry. Lovely musical soirees at the Cross School's house and uh, doing some singing, so I joined the University of Chicago Chorus. And uh, we did a concert with Peter Schickley, also known as P.D. Kubach, for those of you who know, very funny guy. And uh, I got to play the kazoo because I was a clarinetist, so he thought that I might be able to play the kazoo at this one of the pieces. But the highlight, of course, was meeting my better half, uh, Robin. So... Here's a couple of pictures of us in, in Chicago. Um, in the second year I was there, um, the second the one below with our little cat, Erica, I think her name was. Robin will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and then we got married. So this is uh, at the wedding and my mother at the top. Um, uh, and then uh, you know, the marriage vows at the bottom. So that was a very good time and, and clearly uh, has had a tremendously positive effect on my whole life, um, having such a wonderful wife. Uh, I should also put in a word for, for Robin's parents, um, Sarah and Jack Adelson, and, and 
Robin's sister, Sharon, and her husband, Chuck. Since uh, you know, I was an English guy, basically, in the, in, in the States, um, they really filled in as my, uh, my other family, my U.S. family. And uh, Sarah and Jack were always extremely gracious and kind to me. And uh, um, very different family from my family, actually, but, uh, but lo lovely people. And they put up with the fact that I was a guy. So, 76, I had to do something else. Um, and this time, I actually kind of got something like a real job. I'm not sure if it really was a real job, but uh, I went back to London and uh, worked in an organization called World Fertility Survey. So, I was recruited by a, a famous statistician called Maurice Kendall, or Sir Maurice Kendall, who directed the World Fertility Survey and came around set, trying to get people to, to join in and, uh, and participate in this uh, big project. Um, so Sir Morris was a prominent statistician and noted for a treatise, the advanced theory of statistics um, in like three volumes um, and was knighted for his work in, uh, in, in, in Britain for the government. Um, I actually wrote an article about the time of the World Fertility Survey and the American statistician and this is just a, a quote from it. So I speculated in my oral presentation that Kendall agreed to direct the World Fertility Survey in order to assemble a cricket team for which he could act as umpire. In fact, a team of doubtful skill was assembled, uh, was assembled from WFS staff and played some games providing many laughs for the assembled, assembled masses. Just as an aside, actually, bloody Kendall's nose running for a fast single. And he had to go to hospital to get stitches in his nose. So, this is not very good behavior for, 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 for if, if you have a boss. But uh, Kendall actually took it in good part, I have to say. Well, what was the World Fertility Survey? Between matches, Kendall built from scratch an organization that executed national sample surveys in human fertility in 42 developing countries, providing data of unprecedented quality and value on the study of population. WFS provided access to the current created was created to assess the current state of human fertility throughout the world by promoting and supporting nationally representative, comparable and scientifically designed sample surveys of fertility behavior. Uh, Sir Morris loved to say that these were probability surveys as opposed to the Europeans who were not doing probability surveys. He thought that was great. Actually, and Leslie Kish, who some of you all may, may know, was quite heavily involved in the design of the World Fertility Survey. He was a statistician at uh, Michigan. Kendall was very, uh, was a funny guy. I mean, he was very creative. And uh, for those of you who don't know um, any of his work, you might have, the American statistician has probably published a poem called Hiawatha, Hiawatha Designs an Experiment that was based on the meter of Longfe Longfellow's basic poem, Hiawatha. So uh, I'll just give you a brief excerpt of this, which I think is really brilliant. So. Hiawatha, mighty hunter, he could shoot 10 arrows upwards, shoot them with such strength and swiftness that the last had left the bowstring ere the first to earth descended. This was commonly regarded as a feat of skill and cunning. One or two sarcastic spirits pointed out to him, however, that it might be much more useful if he sometimes hit the target. Why not shoot a little straighter and employ a smaller sample? Hiawatha, who at college majored in applied statistics, consequently felt entitled to instruct his fellow men on any subject whatsoever, waxed exceedingly indignant, talked about the law of error, talked about truncated normal, talked, about, talked of loss of information, talked about his lack of bias, pointed out that in the long run, independent observations, even though they missed the target, had an average point of impact very near the spot he aimed at with the possible exception of a set of measure zero, and so on and on. Wonderful, wonderful poem. <clears throat> so I, it was great times at World War II. So I did a lot of traveling, some of, them, some of it with Robin, and, uh, and got to uh, have an interest in survey sampling, which uh, was, uh, was reflected in my later research. Anyway, in 1980, um, Don Rubin, who I had known from uh, uh, editorial stuff, and also because he worked on missing data, um, recruited me to uh, to Washington to work on um, 
now at the Environmental Protection Agency. So um, back we went across the Atlantic to Washington, D.C. My first son, David, was born in Washington, D.C. Uh, the year after. So what was EPA like? Well, <clears throat> see a picture, a couple of pictures of Don on the bottom there, one with his Mickey Mouse hat on, which is, I don't know if Don's in the audience, but uh, perhaps you, should com you could comment on the hat if you're there. So. Anyway, the, uh, the job at EPA was a bit of a bust. Raiden came in in 1980, and uh, it's, it was sort of a little bit like what EPA is like today, so they weren't really interested in doing environmental protection. It's interesting enough, uh, the administrator of EPA was Anne Gorsuch, who's actually the, uh, the mother of uh, the Supreme Court guy. <clears throat> well, so the job was a bust, but uh, it did spawn a, a lifelong collaboration with Don. And uh, I don't actually have the original colored letter, letterhead, but uh, this is a, a copy of it. Uh, we formed a consulting corporation called Data Metrics Research Inc., DR for Don and Rod. Um, and did some uh, quite a bit of consulting uh, in this uh, consulting corporation. And then we started uh, on the book on missing data that uh, the first edition came out in 87, and then second edition 2002, and the last third edition just came out last year. So um, tremendous uh, collaboration with Don over the years. He's been tremendously influential for me. Well, the job at EPA didn't pan out that well. So uh, for a year, I actually went to the Census Bureau as an ASA Census NSF fellow, did some work on um, imputation of income in the current population survey with uh, Martin David, who's a, an economist. I tried to get a picture of Martin, but I couldn't find him on the net. Um, and then on survey non-response, a num number of things like that. Um, but then eventually I, I, I managed to get a job in academia. So uh, 1983, I moved to UCLA as an associate professor in biomathematics. So this is a bit of a dodge. I actually got to be a tenured professor without ever having an, a, a, a tenure track assistant professor position, which is a, a, a nice way of avoiding stress if you, can, if, you can, uh, if you can swing it. It's harder these days than it was in those days, I mean. So I was recruited by a guy called Will Dixon, um, who uh, was famous for actually creating um, the first really good statistical software package, BMDP, also did work on trimmed mean, which was getting rid of outliers by, in, in, in methods. Kind of an applied statistician, um, but, uh, and, the, and the recruitment was kind of controversial because there was a kind of a, there was a math modeling side who were perhaps not that interested in having a statistician join the faculty, but uh, Will had a strong person personality and persuaded people to hire me, despite the fact that I'd never had an academic job really, except as a, a, a postdoc. Um, so I did research on missing on the finishing the missing data book and research on methods on missing data. I was the editor of JARS Applications at one point. And um, so I like Limerick. So I, we, had a, we had a fun Limerick competition um, for Will Dixon's retirement party in 86. Um, I can't show you some of the Limericks because they're not PC enough, but uh, this is uh, uh, one of my Limericks, the data of young Sherman Melenkoff had extremes that were knocking his stockings off. He called in Will Dixon, whose trend mean soon fixed him. Dr. M became Dean, biomath took off. Also made up a, an imaginary seminar series, a bit like my, my uh, uh, qualifying exam. Um, this must have been April Fool's Day kind of a thing. So I made up a, a spoof of seminars like water, water everywhere, nor any a drop to model, a zero compartmental model for the drought in California. We now have compartment models for COVID, I guess. So that would have been a real talk. Noah's Ark, we analyzed the survival analysis with paired data. The extremely moronic algorithm, the Puglia transfer, Puglia transfer, I can't read my writing, and other pet perversions. Ken Lang, who was here for a while, genetics guys will know. 
the reverse obscurely lateral and inversely diagonal system, Rolades, equations for modeling transport through the large intestinal tract, um, skimming floppy disks, um, and other diversions. Uses of VMDCP software before the inversion of the, the, the invention of the computer, and so on. Also, California, a family growing up, David, uh, uh, and then Andrew, born in 1984, shortly after we went to uh, California. Here's a picture of Robin with, with David. I'm sorry, I don't have too many pictures with Andrew. I, I didn't. This was, these were some slides, and this was not a time when I took many pictures with slides. Also on the right, climbing and walking in the, uh, in the wonderful California mountains. This is a picture with Jeremy Taylor and, and, and Liza, his wife on uh, the top of uh, Mount Whitney, which is the highest mountain in uh, California. <clears throat> so from Los Angeles, I got recruited to be the chair of our stat at uh, Michigan. So this is the last stage of uh, my uh, journey. And uh, for those of you who know, most of you know this already, but uh, it's a great place to live. So Midwest friendly people. It's a, a wonderful university and uh, a, a terrific town. Um, I've had great collaborators, colleagues, and staff. Fantastic students who I try to get to do most of the work, which they generally did. No earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, just the odd lost tornado. Um, so we have songs. So uh, you've seen that I like to, to do covers of songs. And uh, so we have the song for the department. We are Biostat Michigan's where we're at, and we love all those symbols and graphs. Others think our t tests are dull and flat, but our data's a barrel of laughs. We are Biostat Michigan's where we're at, with our sons and our PCs three. Should old equations be forgot, Biostat is the place for me. Limericks I like, so this is a limerick for Noreen Clark, who's the Dean of the School of Public Health. Little girls, she comes from Scotland, by the way, you might notice from my accent. Little girls should be not heard but seen, said Mark Clark to a naughty Noreen. Oh, I really hate maths, Ma. My dream's to cure asthma. Now she talks, people listen. She's Dean. And skits, so we, we like to do skits in the department, and this actually was the first skit that we did um, with, uh, uh, I don't know if, if Raghu was part of this, I know Brahma was part of this, writing this, but uh, uh, so it opened Brahma. You can, sit, you can say your line if you like, Brahma. Oh my God, I'm done for, I'm going back to India. What's wrong? Did you get a speeding ticket, says Robin. Heavens no, much worse. Fail to get tenure, says Robin. No, oh, much worse. Robin, are you pregnant? No, no, much, much, much worse. I give up. Calm down and tell me the whole story. Well, it's your husband. You dragged him to the British Museum too many times last summer, and he came back infatuated with the glories of the British Raj, a bit like what Raghu was saying in his introduction. Ever since that, he's been acting very strange. Tell me about it. Have you seen the Union Jack he's planted outside our house? Yes, and he's instituted tea and scones in the department every day. Silly skits at faculty meetings and cricket matches at department picnics. Then there's this dress code in the department, jacket and tie for the men. All the women have to wear dresses, gloves, and silly hats, and so on. Then singing, wonderful times singing uh, for various choirs. This is uh, from the New York Times in 2004, um, Balkan Songs of Innocence and Experience, which uh, Number won a number of Grammys, of which I have a little certificate for being in the choir. This was the picture in the Times and sees uh, Hill Auditorium with a huge stage and orchestra, actually or orchestra of students, not a professional orchestra, huge choirs. And uh, I'm in there somewhere. So actually, that's me in the back there. We had to sit, for, we had to stand for like three and a half hours for this thing. And I was very happy that I got a spot right on the back so I could actually lean against the wall rather than having to stand up uh, on my own but, uh, but a very fun time. Um, 
for a couple of years, I went to the Census Bureau and worked um, for, uh, for them, uh, actually starting a new research and methodology a directorate um, instigated by uh, Bob Groves, who was uh, at Michigan ISR and uh, became the Census Bureau director um, in 2010 and uh, was an advocate for, for, for better methodology. Um, this is a picture of me being sworn in with Bob Groves on, on the right. Bob, Bob is now a fantastic uh, guy. He's now the uh, provost of Georgetown University. So I wrote a, a blog, I'm not going to do the link here, but to uh, um, Huffington Post uh, with uh, Tom Lewis, who is actually my successor at the census, uh, on the importance of, uh, st of government statistics and government statistician for, uh, uh, for giving us the facts, basically, rather than making our stuff. Um, I guess our current um, president likes to do a lot of making up stuff. I won't go into that here. Then, uh, you know, lots of friends, time, good times with, with faculty, colleagues. This is just one uh, celebrating Brummer's uh, uh, time at the Cancer Center with uh, uh, Mike Benke and folks, uh, Jack Kalfleisch and uh, various other folks around the table. So uh, good times with other faculty. Hikes. So uh, I've organized a couple of hikes, uh, the joint statistical meetings. The first one at Vancouver turned out to be a bit more of an ordeal than was expected. <laughs> so those of you who survived, uh, I'm glad. And then Denver is a bit more of a leisurely affair, but uh, a lot of fun too um, with students and ex-students and so on. And then family, family of course flown, replaced by our two dogs, uh, you can't really see Hobbs, but he's on the lower left, and I'm holding him in the picture on the lower left. And Chewy, uh, his successor, is our top right. And then uh, top left is Andrew. Um, uh, when he had long hair, he has less hair now. So, but he's a professor of political science at, at Berkeley. And uh, in the middle, um, David, our older son, who's uh, this was his white coat summary. He went to Michigan a Medical School and is now uh, a, a a practicing doctor in Brooklyn, in New York. So they've both been very successful and done great things. So I'm coming near the end. Um, in, uh, uh, I guess, 2012, um, I, I was invited, I think Jack wrote a nice letter to me, actually, for me, I thank him for that, um, to give the Fisher Lecture at the Joint Statistical Meetings. And uh, the, the lecture was about simplicity in statistics, so I called it Simplicity Not Mathematistry, 10 Simple Ideas in, in Statistics. Um, and uh, at the end of the lecture, I did something a little bit unusual. I actually played a bit of music. So I told you about my love of music, and particularly Baroque music, and in particular music of, of George Frederick Handel, who I think is a, a wonderful, wonderful composer. And so I played uh, one of my favorite um, pieces that, uh, that cap encapsulates simplicity in music. Um, it's a piece from Handel's Oratorio, and I hope you'll be able to hear this if I click on this link. Uh, if it didn't, doesn't work, then let me know. Mm -hmm. Can't hear it. Thank you. 
I'll finish not very long. Rod. And no, there's no music. Okay, so uh, I, I guess the news, music's not working. I tried it yesterday and it seemed to work, but that's uh, Zoom peculiarities. So I'll have to play it to you all some other time. But anyway, let me just finish by saying some, sometimes people ask for my wisdom. I don't like to give wisdom, but I would say work hard, have fun, be tolerant of others. Nobody's perfect. Don't take yourself too seriously. And I'd like to thank uh, mentors listed there, my colleagues at UAM, super students and at, at UCLA and Michigan. All my love to my family, uh, Robin, David, and Andrew, family and friends, and thank you very much for listening. So that concludes my lecture. So if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hands or you can type it in a, a Q&A box. I have a first question. If you didn't become a statistician, what you would have been? Well, um, as I said, when I uh, finished my bachelor's degree at Cambridge, I actually applied for various jobs and, and I did get some interviews. So um, I remember getting an interview for the, the National Coal Board um, and uh, I remember the interview was bizarre to me because, what? Oh, my hand. Robin is talking to me, telling me what to do, as usual. So uh, um, they gave us this flow chart which described the, what the organization was about. And I must say, I had absolutely no, no idea what this was all about, why you, what, what the flu flow chart was even about at all. But uh, so I was probably fairly incompetent in that interview, which is why they didn't give me a job. But, so I would probably have been a, a cutting minors if, I, if I'd got that job, which would have been singularly depressing. So um, probably the, the, the best thing that ever happened to me was not getting a job, which actually shows you actually that sometimes life takes odd twists and turns, right? You don't really know where, you have no idea where you're going to end up. So. Probably something mathy, but... Uh, so I would like to have been able to say a singer, but I'm sure I would have failed at that. So. <laughs> so, okay, there's a question on Q&A. So what is your twin brother, Chris, ended up doing? Yeah, so tw Chris, I don't know if Chris is on the call, actually. I'm not sure if he, if he joined or not. But he uh, did a master's degree in, 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 in theoretical statistics. In, 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 uh, sorry, in theoretical mathematics, not, not statistics. Um, partly because he was a he was a better student than me, so he got a better degree, um, and then ended up um, doing uh, uh, as a school teacher, and actually, but also in charge of the S level exam, uh, the A level exam in mathematics in uh, in, in 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 England. Um, so he he had, he stayed in mathematics, um, whereas I, I I I morphed into statistics, which to, to me was kind of a good deal, but. Uh, Purely by accident. There's another question here. After all the moving before, why have you stayed at Michigan? <laughs> why have I stayed at Michigan? Um, well, I, I just I, I like so many things about it that I've never felt impelled to go anywhere else. So, um, I mean, I, I, I said in my slide. I mean, I love living, love living in Ann Arbor. I think Ann Arbor is a wonderful town. And, uh, uh, we have a fantastic department, as as you know, um, great colleagues, um, um, and 
Um, and you know, there's nothing not to like about it as far as I'm concerned. I'm not really a big city sort of a guy, so I've spent some time in big cities, but uh, to me, uh, um, Ann Arbor's just, just, just can't be better, so. But sure, I, I think- have a, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So in your journey, uh, you did not talk much about being chair. Was that a deliberate <laughs> choice? Uh, and so, if so, I just want to know, like, of course, you know, uh, this department, it would be very fair to say that this department would not be what it is without your transformative and impactful leadership. So, uh, but when you shared your journey, it does not appear building, mm -hmm. recruiting this department. So maybe some of the good and bad things about being in that role? Yeah, well, um... I delegated a fair bit. I mean, as you probably noticed from all these other interests, that I'm a fairly lazy sort of a person. So I, I don't really, I'm not a very big detail sort of a guy. And um, so that's probably what, one piece of advice <laughs> is to get, try and get other people to do the, do the work. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, um, my style to, to the extent that it was, it's was, it was very collaborative and, uh, um, and I, for example, I didn't come in with very strong ideas as to where the department should be going. I mean, my sense was hire the best people you can and just let it go in the direction it wants to go in. And, uh, and, and as a result, I think we have a, a pretty diverse department that's not necessarily specializing in any particular one thing. Obviously, the, our genetics folks are fantastic. But, but in general, we have a lot of, uh, of bows to our arrows. Uh, is that the right word? Bows to our quiver, or that's it. That's the expression. Um, so, uh, um, and, and we have a kind of a, a democratic, democratic way of, of running things. So I think uh, giving everybody a voice and uh, trying to make the consensus decision is sort of the way I, I, I think um, things have gone. I think the way, the way they should, be, should have gone, which is why I think we've been pretty successful. I don't, I don't think that it, I don't attribute very much of it to me, I have to say. The, the, the time when I was recruited was fairly uh, a stressful time for the department. The previous person who'd asked to, uh, who, who they'd asked to, uh, to take the job had eventually turned them down. So they were casting around for anybody. And uh, so they found me actually. Although Nick Jewell, interesting enough, also applied for, for the chair position. So Nick Jewell was the guy who was uh, also at Glasgow Academy. So. So we kind of joked that uh, to, to, to get an interview at Michigan, you had to go to Glasgow Academy. <laughs> so, so they gave it to me, but then Nick became the provost of Berkeley. So yeah, he had a much grander job. Yeah, Thank a, you for modesty. Yeah, so I have a question here on the chat. Um, did you carry forward any of your operations, research, training and learning? Well, the short answer is no, partly because I didn't have any. So, uh, so as I said, the master's degree was 95% statistics and 5% operation research. The, 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 the operation research thing, oh, actually one thing I should say. So for those of you who, uh, this is more statistical, I apologize for those who are not statisticians, but the, the sweep operator, right? So the, for, for, um, for doing EM calculations for the normal distribution, was basically uh, an OR thing. So that's an OR algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, Martin Beale talks about it in, in, in his book on operation, on, on, on linear programming. So, so that's one thing that is, I, I guess, OR. But, uh, Martin Beale, um, who was a, a one lovely, lovely person, was a completely terrible lecturer. So that might be another reason why <laughs> I didn't, didn't, didn't pick anything up. But it was nearly all statistics and, uh, and I really, I have to say, I kind of, statistics was, is better. I can say that in this forum, right? So. <laughs> now, OR oh, is a useful thing, but statistics is fantastic. So the question here, did you know at UCLA, UM PhD graduate, Noel Wheeler? Yes, I did, yeah. Noel was, uh, she ran the consulting clinic at, at uh, UCLA. Uh, when I was there. 
No, I, I didn't actually talk much about the, the faculty of, of biomath, which is with, with an, an, an interesting cast of characters, but uh, that would be a whole other lecture to talk about that. So. <laughs> Except some of them had a, and, uh, Elliot Landau, who was the chair for a while, has a wonderful sense of humor, so funny guy. So here's another question here. How many days did it take you and your team to submit Mont Blanc? Did it involve some ice climbing? Uh, I think it was, it was a couple of days. So. Um, actually, uh, it's not the usual route up Mont Blanc. Um, it's not the tourist route up Mont Blanc these days. It, it went through the Argentière glacier, which is why there was a picture of uh, us with ice axes, because we were going through a glacier. Uh, we, it didn't involve very technical climbing at all. Um, but I was very fit in those days. So the, that, that route, the first 3,000 feet was by, you could take a telephorique, which was basically a, 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 um, a um, ski lift kind of a thing. Um, that would get you up the first 3,000 feet. So we went to the cabin at the bottom and there was a long line of people getting into the cell free. So we just decided to walk up anyway. So we just walked up the 3,000 feet instead of, instead of taking the thing. So I wish I could do that now. <laughs> we were definitely fit. So, so I, I did do a little bit of snow and ice climbing there, but I, I, I've never done uh, terribly difficult climbing. Um, my brother actually, who's done a um, used to take kids to the Alps. Um, is um, a, a, a much has done a lot more climbing than I have, and uh, um, has more more experiences to tell on that that angle. It's a really amazing journey you have you have uh, <laughs> talked to us about, and uh, thank you for that. And um, you know, it's funny because the, everybody has amazing journeys, but they don't seem amazing to you because it's just what you've done, right? So, yeah, well, it's just, I, it, I it's think, just think, it. So. Yeah, but I, I think that this is an amazing journey for all of us to see that, <laughs> what you have done, what you have accomplished. And it is, um, I'm so glad that I think we are part of your journey too. So I think that is, that is a really, um, I can't, I can't, I can't, um, thank you enough for all the journeys and all the things that you have um, you have done. Um, for Thanks, all Raghu, of and it's been great fun working with you over the years. So, we, uh, Raghu and I have done a lot of short courses together. We're supposed to be writing this book, so eventually we'll get it read. Yes, with with uh, Mike Elliott. Yeah, and 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 I can tell you that I think teaching uh, preparing slides with Rod is an art. <laughs> <laughs> and he would have all these transitions and colors and so on. And I was just doing everything black and white, you know, and then suddenly <laughs> he says, no, 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 we have to have color. So the colors have meaning and uh, amazing how much effort that um, we, he puts in on these, all these short courses. So I just, so as a last order of business, I'm sharing my screen of this very prestigious certificate of tribute <laughs> that uh, there is no cash prize associated with uh, Journey Lectures, but this award and our deepest tribute uh, to Rod uh, for being a part of our journey, for uh, leading this department, for representing its uh, values and cultures, and for all the silly skits and all the songs that you have written, the art and the science blending of your existence is this Renaissance scholarship, which we are very, very fortunate to be around, just experience and witness. So thank you for that. Uh, those of you who joined my YouTube, thank you. Uh, sorry for the initial technical glitches. This is the first time we are doing it. Um, and thank you for, thank you to those of you who joined by Zoom uh, for the post, uh, uh, talk tea, virtual tea. We are going to take a five minute break and use that Zoom link that I pasted in the chat and I shared with you uh, with the department in my email this morning. We'll join there. Thank you so much, Rod. We are so grateful for Thank you. you. So it's been great fun. So 
I'm sorry the music didn't work at the end, but if you if you wanted if you want to do it on Spotify or something, it's called "Convey Me to a Distant Shore." And, if you uh, want to was... paste the link uh, in the chat before we end, we can. Uh, uh, I don't actually. Oh, I, I can give you the the description of what it was. Yeah. It's uh, I, I don't do Spotify. I just do uh, CDs and things. But uh, I'm sure you can probably find this on you. YouTube. The conductor um, was uh, um, has actually visited Ann Arbor. Uh, uh, and actually, um, I don't know if Renee Fleming has, but uh, um, she has that too. So. If you want to know my idea of simplicity, then you can Google that and find it on probably find it on YouTube. So. Um, I, I I can go on and on about music, but uh, so um, handle handle is my uh, handle is my idol. So. so maybe we can have that conversation in the Zoom meetings where everybody can participate and there is not, not a silence on one side. And so thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining. A uh, wonderful journey lecture and have a wonderful evening and rest of the week. Thank you.